My name is Michael Liu. I'm the Director of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau at the Health Resources and Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I was asked to talk about my vision for what we can do as a nation to improve maternal health. But before I do that, let me just take a moment to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership and service of the Coalition for Improving Maternity Services. I was with you in San Diego in 2009. I've known many of you over the years. I've seen firsthand the energy, the passion, the commitment you bring to the work of improving maternal health in our nation. You remind me of what Dr. King said about human progress. He said that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals like yourselves. I'm sorry I can't be there in person this year, but I want to tell you just how much I admire and appreciate all that you do for maternal and child health in our nation. Now as for my vision, here's what I think we need to do. We're going to improve maternal health in this nation by improving access, quality, integration, prevention, and equity. So let's start with access. Access is always a good place to start because I believe that healthcare is a building block to building health and access to decent healthcare ought to be an American birthright. And I believe that the Affordable Care Act is going to be a game changer for maternal health. The ACA is the most significant women's health law in the last 50 years. The ACA put an end to the discriminatory practice of gender rating, charging women higher premium because of their gender. It also prohibits the practice of denying coverage for pre-existing conditions like breast cancer or C-section and lifetime caps on benefits, which will expand access for millions of women with chronic conditions. The ACA also extends dependent coverage up to age 26 and through Medicaid expansion and subsidies for women who lack employer-sponsored health insurance, the ACA expands access to health care coverage for nearly 19 million previously uninsured women. And beginning August of last year with implementation of clinical preventive services for women, an additional 47 million women will gain access to preventive health services even when they're not pregnant, including intimate partner violence screening and counseling, HIV screening and counseling, STI counseling, HPV DNA testing, FDA approved contraceptive product, gestational diabetes screening, breastfeeding support, and well woman visit including preconception and interconception care without copay, which will provide an extraordinary opportunity to improve women's health, not only during pregnancy, but before, between, and beyond pregnancy and across their life force. The supporting full implementation of the ACA is going to be one of my top priorities in the coming years, but I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help with outreach and enrollment, especially for some of the harder to reach families in your community. I'm going to need your help to educate your colleagues and your community about the ACA so we can make the most of the opportunities afforded by the Affordable Care Act to improve maternal health in our nation. Second, quality. I don't think I need to talk to your group about quality. You've been the champions of quality and safety in maternity services in our nation. But we all know that there's still plenty of room for quality improvement in the care that pregnant women receive in this country. Whether we're talking about developing guidelines and protocols and toolkits and triggers and so forth to assist providers with management of obstetrical complications such as thrombosis and thromboembolism, preeclampsia and hemorrhage, or we're talking about upholding the principles of mother-friendly childbirth initiative about the normalcy of birthing process, empowerment, autonomy, do no harm, and responsibility. And we know that better care can lead to better outcomes and lower costs. Just look at what the 13 southern states are now doing around early elective deliveries. With the adoption of a few simple quality improvement measures, these states have been able to significantly reduce their rates of late preterm and early term deliveries, in some cases, NICU emissions. Better care, better outcomes, lower costs. Going forward, I'm going to need your leadership and partnership to continue to drive this quality movement in maternity and perinatal services. Third, 
integration. Of course, everything we've been learning about quality improvement over the last 30 years is that QI is not just about making individuals work harder, it's about making the systems work smarter. And key to making the system work smarter is more integration, vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal. Vertical integration in terms of appropriate levels of care. Horizontal integration in terms of care coordination and systems integration, not only within healthcare, but across systems, WIC, social services, public health, community programs. Longitudinal integration in terms of that continuum of women's health across the life course, not only during those nine months of pregnancy, but before, between, and beyond pregnancy. And let me just say a word about vertical integration or appropriate levels of care. When we talk about perinatal regionalizations these days, most people think of very low birth weight babies being born in hospitals with level three or specialized NICUs. Now I'm reminded that when perinatal regionalization started more than 30 years ago, it referred to both maternal as well as neonatal levels of care. Just as high-risk babies ought to be born in hospitals with NICUs that are equipped to care for high-risk babies, high-risk moms ought to be cared for in hospitals that are equipped to care for high-risk moms, and there's some evidence that that might improve outcomes. But appropriate levels of care also means that low-risk moms don't all need to be cared for in a tertiary center, that no woman should be subjected to any unnecessary interventions, and that every woman should be cared for in a system that respects her autonomy and upholds the principles of empowerment, do no harm, and responsibility, and be given a choice of the mother-friendly maternity services that you all champion. Fourth, prevention. This is another area where we can do a lot better. There needs to be greater focus on prevention and health promotion in maternity services, especially given everything we've been learning over the last decade about developmental origins of health and disease and the important role that nutrition, stress, and support, mental health, and environmental exposures play in fetal programming and maternal health. We've really got to do a lot better in talking about these topics with our clients and their families. We've also got to do a lot better in promoting healthy weight before, during, and ha after pregnancy. Obesity is an important risk factor for maternal mortality and morbidity. We've got to do a lot better in helping women achieve a healthier weight before pregnancy, helping them gain within IOM guidelines during pregnancy, and helping them lose that weight after pregnancy and avoid postpartum weight retention, which is a major driver of the obesity epidemic among women of childbearing age. Promoting family planning and effective contraception is an effective strategy for preventing unintended pregnancies and promoting optimal birth spacing. I don't need to talk to you about the benefits of breastfeeding, but we've got to do a lot better as a nation in promoting breastfeeding. Cesarean delivery increases the risk of placenta accreta, which in turn increases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage and cesarean hysterectomy, and the rate of cesarean delivery has also been on the rise. Cesarean rate rose by 53% from 1996 to 2007, reaching 32%, the highest rate ever reported in the United States. That is, in 2007, one in three babies born in the United States were delivered by cesarean. That's 1.3 million cesarean deliveries that year. Now, cesarean has its place, but given the real risks associated with cesarean, it should not be performed without clear maternal, fetal, or obstetrical indications. We've still got a lot, a lot of work to do going forward. I'm looking forward to our partnership in strengthening prevention and health promotion in maternity services. Fifth, equity. This is our overarching goal, and you all know that this is a great passion of mine. In the greatest nation on earth, we shouldn't have a threefold gap in pregnancy-related mortality between black and white women. In fact, we shouldn't have a gap at all. We can do a lot better in addressing health disparities and achieving health equity in MCH. I applaud the leadership you've shown in promoting health equity over the years. I want to commend you for confronting disparities in maternity care as the theme of your forum this year. I know you're going to be taking on issues of disparities in access, quality, systems, and prevention. I look forward to hearing from you about what you've learned. But I also want you to keep in mind that we're not going to close the gaps in maternal health with healthcare alone. 
This is because there are important social determinants operating across the life course that are the real drivers of health disparities in maternal health. Education and housing and poverty and the father absence and racism. Now it's not our job to solve all these social problems, but it's our job to look to partner with those who can. This means we can't stay in our silos anymore. At the federal level, there are other agencies whose work has just as big, if not bigger impact on maternal health than the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. CMS, Bureau of Primary Healthcare, CDC, NIH, just to name a few. But if we're going to really improve maternal health in this country, we have to reach out beyond our comfort zone. We have to reach out to the Departments of Agriculture, HUD, Education, EPA, and so forth. So that's a lot of what I've been doing since I've gotten here, building bridges to these partners. Now at the state and local levels, I need you to do the same, building partnership, building coalitions across sectors, across silos, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. That's the only way we're going to win this fight against maternal mortality and morbidity. That's the only way we're going to close the gaps in maternal health. So in closing, let me just tell you that HRSA, in partnership with many of our federal and state public and private partners, are planning to launch a major national initiative on maternal health by Mother's Day this year. In the coming months, I will be sharing more specifics with you. It's time that we put the M back in MCH, and going forward, I'm going to need your partnership and your leadership in this endeavor. So on behalf of HRSA and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, let me tell you again just how much I admire and appreciate all that you do for maternal health, and thank you for your leadership and your service in improving maternity services in our nation. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm there with you in spirit, and I wish you all a great forum.